welcome you to our worship service. We would like to wish a happy birthday this week to Kennedy Fisher, Wyatt Mitchell. Person Wyatt, I thought you were Wyatt, happy birthday. And Dee Fang. Our second <laughs> flowers are given to the honor and glory of God and for July's celebrations in memory of birth by Jamie and Diane Buck. You will find attendance books at the end of each row. Please take a minute and sign that so that we can keep accurate records on our attendance. The Kicks and Youths will be having a swell party at the Jameson's home this evening.
scary. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, For where two or three gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. This morning, our call to worship is, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Please call, uh, stand and uh, join me as we sing. Even the darkness is not dark to you. 
The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for you are filled filled and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. You know me very well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unborn substance. In your book were written the days that were formed for me, every day before they came into being. How profound to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who maliciously defy you, who lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate them that I hate that hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe them that rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way Gracious God, at this very moment, we count the blessing of being cool, of being safe, of being free, of being loved. Lord, as we worship you, we give back of our heart, but also of all the other blessings that you have given to us. Take it, multiply it, use it, Lord, for your kingdom here on earth and us in your service. In Christ's holy name.
believe this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sent at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of the sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Perry. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Misty, for leading us with music. And, you know, John Wesley said to praise God in all ways, and when you got nothing else, go ahead and preach. <laughs> we celebrate the ways that our music touches our hearts. Sometimes I think that only art and music are the real ways to match the majesty of God. We preachers make good attempts. Sometimes we did it right, but all we can do is try. As we pray, y'all tell me something good. What are we celebrating? Band camp is over. Band camp is over. But there is a band camp. I'm thinking, I'm kind of celebrating. We're kind of getting back to school, getting back into the routines. Is there an amen cue? Okay, is there an uh cue? Uh, all right. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, I think uh, football's doing two a days now. Stay hydrated, band camp's out there, band camp's over. Y'all got your routine down, got your marching out? All right, look forward to coming to see that. Uh, teacher, y'all get your classrooms ready? <laughs> uh, okay, all right. I, know, I think uh, summer's kind of winding down, people coming back from their trips and, and uh, um, getting back, we're out buying pens and pencils, and some of us are buying refrigerators, and we look at going far away. So, a lot of excitement, a lot of energy. Uh, as we prepare, we just recognize the change of the seasons as the summer comes to an end and we pick back up with football season and school. Know that God is with us, even in those changes. And there's a couple of these young parents going to be sending their children off to school for the first time. Ooh. Prayers are lifted. As we celebrate, we have still plenty that we keep on our hearts and minds. Um, Leonard Blanton is still in ICU over at UMC. He's doing a little better. They're trying to get him off the ventilator, but we continue to pray for he and Vera, and of course Susan and Mike and family and all those that, that pray for them. Uh, you want to speak to anything about treatments going on with? Um, okay. Doing well. We just keep on keeping on. All right, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, we just want to let everybody know that our daughter, Katie, is graduating from Lincoln City College Thursday. She's going to be a vet tech. Katie's going to be a vet tech, graduating from mine. She's a good one, too. We're just, um, see, we're just grateful and blessed that since the first morning, the first plant was doing well. That was back in March, and now he's headed to his next one, August the third. So we'd like everybody's prayers for us and for the donors' families. He's going to have to donate those twenty percent. We realize that those donations come from some, somewhere. Did it? Yes, sir. I'm grateful that we we're well on our way to having a new roof on the church before we had any major problems with the old. Well, I'm grateful that we have a team of stewards to, to watch over the property as we had some straight line winds. Of course, we lost the, the awning. We lost a lot of parts of the roof and some other things. Very expensive fix, but uh, you already see the progress. And I'm watching those folks come out here. They're out here by 7 a.m. and they don't leave till 7 p.m. And I think I will last about 30 minutes in all that room. Man, I am grateful that there are people to do that job. I'm grateful that we have people that fix air conditioners because a lot of them are going out this time of the year with the capacitors and things like that. We have soldiers that are constantly out there practicing, being ready to defend us. We have fire folks, we have police, we have first responders that are rare. Can you imagine responding to a fire in this kind of heat and having to wear all that equipment? Uh, it's unreal. 
just keep these folks in our thoughts and in our prayers. And don't forget to give thanks. Um, I was handed a note. It's a good thing to hand me a note because anybody that knows me knows I forget uh, really fast up here in the pulpit. But Roger and Linda um, asked for us to lift up their nephew, Wilson Polk. Did I get that correctly? Uh, Wilson and family were traveling, and Wilson had some kind of an event and ended up in the ICU in Mobile, Alabama. So they are traveling. They're not home, but they had to stop in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, because according to the note, he's not doing good and uh, that they've called the family in. So y'all reach out to Roger and Linda and keep Wilson and family in prayers. I mean, it's tough enough to be sick, but to be sick and not be at home. And so uh, we pray for them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, somebody said something about Heinz that reminded me. I'm going back to the daycare at Heinz next school year. All right. This school year next school year. So, All right. Yeah. Blessings abound. Struggles abound. God abounds. But that's why we're here. And as we unite our hearts, just for a moment, just let it all go. Let all the politics go. Let all the craziness go. Let all the fighting go. Let all the fussing go. And just know that God is with us. And may we be filled with that love and spirit. May we be energized and renewed. And as we unite our hearts, the Lord be with you. Gracious God, we look for you in so many ways. We look for you in leaders. But our leaders turn out to be human and have faults and failures. We look for you in laws, and our laws turn out to be inadequate because they can't cover everything. We look for you in so many other things than ourselves, and we like to point fingers when things fail and when things aren't the way that we want it to be. So Lord, Help us to be still, as your prophet was still. Help us to just relax and know that you are God. And for all that screams at us in our minds and in our hearts, let us hear your words once again to the storm, peace be still. That we may find renewal, that we may find courage, that we may find hope. That as we leave this place, we know that God goes with us. Lord, as we pray all these things, as we lift up all that we've spoken of and those that we carry in our hearts, we realize our inadequacy in even trying. But you knew about that long before we started to pray. And so, Lord, we celebrate that you gave us a way to pray, and you taught us. Let us pray in our hearts.
stick your finger in Ephesians chapter 3 if you want to. I'm going to end up there eventually. But I'm going to invite you to turn to Genesis 28. Now, um, I'm coming back to my, my soap opera. I know I, I got deferred last week because we had to talk about Babylon because of BDS and stuff like that. But I'm back to my soap opera. Because I think this is just the greatest story ever and I think it should be celebrated. And I think most of the time we don't know about it because it just hasn't been a big TV event. But, you know, think about it. Just join with me in the craziness as we think about it. It's the saga of Abraham and his family. But it's not just a saga. It's a promise. It's the covenant that God made with Abraham. Who remembers the covenant? Threefold. One, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Which is ironic and crazy since he was very aged and so was his wife, Sarah, and they only had two kids. <laughs> well, one through Hagar, that's a different story. But the second fold is that your descendants uh, are, um, yeah, your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky and like the dust on the earth. And your people will inherit the land of Canaan. But three, and most importantly, you will be a blessing. To all the earth and to all nations. And we put a lot of effort into talking about the begatten chapter, the begatten in the King James, which of course the so and so was the father, so and so was the father, so and so, because we run that line all the way to Jesus Christ, which is the ultimate blessing of all the world. And so it's important that we realize God has chosen this covenant, this promise with Abraham who seems like the most unlikely person <coughs> in a variety of ways. And I think it's important as we think about, as we read the Bible, who does God choose to work through? Does God choose to work through the best, through the smartest, through the most capable, through the most holy? No. But God does choose through those who will give themselves over to God's will. And so it's the saga. It's the soap opera. And it's wild and crazy as, first of all, we have that Abraham can't have any kids, yet he's got this promise. And God finally comes to him, or Sarah at least comes to him and says, well, I tell you what, we're going to bring in the handmaiden Hagar, and you have some kids through her. And so he has the oldest, Ishmael. But God does bless Sarah, and she does have a kid. Now we have the spinoff of the TV show, The Real Housewives of Beersheba. Because as soon as Sarah has a son, she says, she's got a government. And they kick Hagar out, along with the child Ishmael. They worry about how Hagar couldn't watch, bear to watch him die and starve in the desert. And so she put him aside, but God said, no, Hagar, this will be a part of the blessing. This will be a part of the future. And God took care of Ethan and Hagar and Ishmael. But that wasn't the promised line. We continue the story, and so uh, Sarah and Abraham do have laughter. Isaac. Now, Isaac is his own story in, in, in as much, uh, but he's not as he's not as interesting. He does tend to pass his, his wife Rebecca off as his sister when he comes up against the Philippine king. Something we remember Abraham did twice. See, the men of this day are real chivalrous. <laughs> But Abraham's story is not quite so dramatized. We have to go down to Abraham's two children. And who remembers Abraham's two kids? No? Anybody remember Abraham's two children? Yeah. Jacob. I, did I say it? I'm sorry. You're right. Anybody remember Isaac's two children? Esau and Jacob. There we go. Young people, y'all remember Esau and Jacob? Okay. Who knows Thor and Loki? Who knows Thor and Loki? Come on. All right. It's, see, if we had a TV show, kids would know our Bible people. But they know more about Norse gods than they do our own Judeo-Christian scriptures. Well, Esau and Jacob were a lot like Thor and Loki. Jacob is the trickster. But Esau, he was the older brother. He was the big one, but he was also hairy and he was also a woodsman. And so I think if we were to do a TV show about Jacob and Esau, Jacob would not be played by Chris Helmsworth, but more like somebody from Duck Dynasty. Okay? 
See, you got to join me in my craziness in my mind. But this is biblical. And but remember that Esau is daddy's boy. Esau loves to hunt, loves to fish, loves to be outdoors. Jacob loves him for it because he goes and he kills wild game and he brings it back and he feeds Jacob. And Jacob loves, no, I'm Jacob. God, keep me straight. Isaac, he comes back and he feeds Isaac and Isaac loves him for it. But Jacob is mama's boy. Jacob's indoors. Jason, Jacob's smart. He's the trickster. And later on in Isaac's life, I'm getting, we're getting to it. You see, every time we, that you go to like season two, you've got to have a wrap up of the previous season. You know, this kind of wrap. The things you, things you missed in season one. But at the end of Isaac's life, when he's about to give the blessing of the firstborn. The blessing of all that he has, all his property and all of his spiritual will. He's about to pass that down. Rebecca whispers into the youngest son, Jacob, and says, you need to slide in there and take that blessing. And so she cooks for him. Now, Esau goes off to hunt to take care of daddy. And while he's away, they get sneaky. And she cooks for him. And Jacob puts on this furry goat hair or something like that. And he rubs dirt on him. And Isaac, old with his eyes dim, he said, I smell Esau, smells like the field. Come here. I feel Esau because he feels furry and fuzzy. And then he reaches out and he blesses Jacob, the second born. And he does it by mistake. But still, there is honor in this. And he gives him the blessing. <laughs> And he doesn't realize the mistake that he's made until Esau comes home. You can't write this stuff. Can't you just see it? I mean, Days of Our Lives has got nothing on the story of Genesis. <laughs> Esau comes home. Found out that Jacob has stolen his birthright. He goes, ah! And he threatens to kill Jacob. Now Jacob's got to run for his life. Think about this in the terms of who God chooses to work with. What we have here is Jacob, the lineage. And God is about to bless him, but Jacob doesn't know about the blessing. Jacob doesn't know about the promise. Jacob doesn't know about the covenant. We know as we read where Jacob speaks to his father Isaac and he says, your God. He doesn't say, my God. Ahead myself. Let's read the scripture for a bit because I got to. We got to make reference to it. I'm having fun. All right. Genesis chapter 28. We're going to start reading in verse 10. Jacob has run for his life. And he's now hiding out in the desert. Jacob left Beersheba, and he set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head, and he lay down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting in the earth, and with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it he stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. And I will give you and your descendants the land on which you were alive. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you. Wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. And when Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he placed under his head, and he set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it. And he called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Love. Beloved, it's the word of God for the people of God. Let the people say, thanks. thanks be God. Lord, thank you for the reminder of your presence among us. As you
tell your story once again through your servant, James. In Christ's holy name, amen. So Jacob is talking to his father, and he says, your God, meaning not my God, meaning not the God I believe in. And then after Esau comes home and he has to flee for his life, he now flees with nothing. He doesn't have any property, doesn't have any family, doesn't have any with him, and he certainly doesn't have God with him. And now here he is out in the desert, and who knows what's going to happen to him. But the good news that we need to hear is that God has not abandoned him. God comes to him in the form of a dream. And in this dream, Jacob has this vision of God's presence. And it's, it's like a ladder. Only it's not really a ladder in the biblical sense. It's more like a ziggurat. You can study ziggurats. You know, it's not a pyramid, but it's got them stepstone things. And you can kind of climb up it like steps, like stairs. In my own vision, I see an escalator. But I know that didn't exist. But yet, it's the place where angels are coming and going because it's the gate of heaven. And sitting at the top is God. And God speaks to Abraham this blessing that I will bless you. I will never leave you. And I will stay with you always until I have done what I have promised. And all the people will be blessed through you and your offspring is the affirmation, once again, of the covenant that God first made with Abraham. Let's talk about covenant for a moment. Remember, covenant is not contract. It's an agreement. It's a relationship, but it's a relationship that is based on something bigger than what's on the paper. It's a relationship be, uh, based on something bigger than both of us. Anybody bought a car or a house? Okay. You signed a contract for that? And what happens if you don't make payment on that car? Do they say, oh, just don't worry about it? No. They don't hold up their end if you won't hold up your end. But how many times have we ever been in a relationship where we had to go to the store? I would say goodbye to Maggie McKee when we were talking about her father. And the people that came and they were hungry and they were starving and they needed support, but Maggie McKee's father, uh, Mr. Sebring, gave them credit. And a lot of times just gave him the food because he was interested in something bigger than money, bigger than himself. He knew Christ in his heart, and he was interested in the kingdom of God. And so they were serving that purpose. Anybody married? In a covenant relationship with your spouse? Has that been perfect? Don't put no into that. <laughs> no, because... When you come to that relationship, you set your eyes on something bigger than just two people and what you can get from one another. You set yourself on something higher. And even those don't always hold together. But the point is, is that God's covenant keeps coming back, even though we don't hold our end of the bargain. The original covenant, the original relationship back in the Garden of Eden was, if you be my people, I'll be your God. And I'll take care of everything. And we failed at keeping that. So God continues to come back in the covenant. In the covenant. I will bless you. And through my blessings, you will bless others. God made that covenant with Abraham. He made it again with Isaac. And now he affirms it again with Jacob. But look at who he's reaching out to. The trickster. The one that didn't believe. The one that's running for his life. Yet God chooses to work through such as this. I think so many times in the church we think that we've got to be perfect. Or we think at least that other people have to be perfect. That other people have to, to be the ones that are the smartest or the prettiest or sing the best or something. Or I can't teach Sunday school because I don't know the Bible. I know more about Thor and Loki than I do eat Jacob and Esau. But you know what? God doesn't call qualified people. But when you give your heart to God, God qualifies you to do the work that you need to do. And this is where Jacob says, surely this is the house of the Lord. This is the place of my father Abraham. This is the place of my father Isaac. This God does exist, and he named it Bethel. Y'all have seen churches named Bethel before? It's really two words in Hebrew. 
Beth being house, and El being two of the old, one of the two oldest names for God. We know about Yahweh, but then there's El, as in El Shaddai, or El Adonai. Bethel means house of God. And where is this? Because at this time period, Moses hasn't built the tabernacle. David hasn't built the temple or Solomon. There is no place of fortune. There are just places where we encounter God. And what we find is that God is already there. Even sometimes in the worst of our moments. Even sometimes in our deserts. Even sometimes in our inadequacy. God reveals God's self to us. In the ICUs. In the waiting rooms. In school. At work. In church. In board meetings. But you have to first of all have the heart of the covenant to see the presence of God in our midst. You have to first of all have the understanding that it's not me. It's not about me. It's never been about me. It's not about politics. It's not about money. It's about something bigger than all of us. It's about love. God's love. So the covenant gets passed down from generation to generation all the way through Jesus Christ who reminded us that yes we had a covenant in the Ten Commandments more like a contract if you keep these ten guess what you know hang down through Moses you will have a relationship with God if you just keep ten y'all keep the commandments maybe y'all try like me but we fail we don't keep our bargain. That's why we need God's covenant. So Jesus said a new command I give you that you, what? Love one another. Paul tries to emphasize this in Ephesians chapter 3. And he says, in starting in verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel, this gospel of love, by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. And although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry. For the ages was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, manifold in his wisdom, he should be known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in through this faith in him, we may approach God with the freedom and the confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings, for which are your glory. Don't be discouraged, folks. In the struggles of this world, in the politics, in the heat, in the whatever's going on in the domination, don't be discouraged. Have faith. Stay true to the covenant that God has with us through the Father Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob. It is passed down from generation to generation, but we have to approach that covenant with the spirit that it was given. That God will be our God and we will be God's people. And when people see us and when people know us and when people come to us, they won't see B.B. Watson or anybody sitting out here. Who will they see? They'll see Jesus Christ. That the world may know that there is a Savior. Let's pray. I thank you, God, for this ongoing saga. That is the struggle of human beings and the drama that affects them. But Lord, it's also the reaffirmation of your covenant and of your love for us. May we so live in that. In Christ's holy name. Our closing hymn is on page 418. Through the struggles of life, sometimes we feel like we're just climbing this ladder. Along with Jacob. 418. I'll invite you to stand as we sing.
upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. But all God's children say, Amen. Amen.